Hey everyone, I've never done this before, but my kids swear that YouTube Live is made for me because I'm a person that wants to share articles and email boxes, which nobody looks at anymore. I want to have deep dinner discussions, which I find that people want to do that if you have a nice round table where it can happen. And um, I just feel like there's so much good in the world trying to pop up. We, we keep looking at the bad headlines. And so as an artist and a mother and a grandmother and a citizen of the world and an armchair philosopher, I, all of this is in my written description, of course, but I just feel like I'd like to share some of this out there in the world of social media where not everything is always so hopeful and optimistic. And it really is up to us to change our thinking and our approach to life and realize that uh, there are no problems outside of our own thinking. So um, I'm getting some little things over here. I think this is working. Anybody there? <laughs> I think it is. Um, nobody's here yet, but they will be. Um, so that's why I'm here. And the thing I haven't done before is read an article. I think that uh, I've been visiting recently uh, talks where the poets read their own work or a novelist reads her own work. And it has been really fun to see and hear see people writing, reading their own materials. And as an artist, of course, we hang our art and you know, get to see people uh, respond to it. So I actually subscribe to this old fashioned thing called a paper newspaper. And I do the Sunday New York Times delivery. I live in Nashville now after a move from Los Angeles, California, after 40 years, I followed two children to Nashville. Uh, one lives, in, another one lives in, uh, Brooklyn and another one lives in Austin. So I'm now kind of with two children, centrally located to others and centrally located to my grandkids. And it's been very interesting to come into a place like Nashville that is super creative, delicious food, wonderful people, and yet be aware of the state of thinking for the entire state. And uh, without getting too political here, I'd like to yet anyway, I'd like to read this article today by David Brooks in the New York Times called The Power of Art in a Political Age. And as an artist, that's what I'm trying to bring out is a feeling of um, hope and cure for dysfunction and uh, really realize that, that humanity is basically good. I'll recommend that book, book another day, Humanity, A Hopeful History, is another book that I've read recently that I think uh, um, you would really love. Okay. The Power of Art in a Political Age. I'm going to do it on screen so I don't have to look down. I have it here. These are, again, words of David Brooks, um, the renowned... Uh, opinion writer in the New York Times. You can also find him on Friday nights on PBS's News Hour. I sometimes feel I'm in a daily struggle not to become a shallower version of myself. The first driver of shallowization is technology. The way it shrinks attention span fills the day with tempting distractions. The second driver is the politicization politicization of everything. Like a lot of people, I spend too much of my time enmeshed in politics, the predictable partisan outrages, the campaign horse race analysis, the Trump scandal du jour. So I'm trying to take countermeasures. I flee to the arts. I'm looking for those experiences we all had as a kid becoming so enveloped by an adventure story that you refuse to put it down to go have dinner, getting so exuberantly swept up in some piece of music that you feel primeval passions thumping within you. 
encountering a painting so beautiful it feels like you've walked right into its alternative world. The normal thing to say about such experiences is that you've lost yourself in a book or song, lost track of space and time. But it's more accurate to say that a piece of art has quieted the self-conscious ego voice that is normally yapping away within. A piece of art has served as a portal to a deeper realm of the mind. It has opened up that hidden, semi-conscious kingdom within us from which emotions emerge, where our moral sentiments are found. Those instant, aesthetic-like reactions that cause us to feel disgust in the presence of cruelty and admiration in the presence of generosity. The arts work on us at that deep level, the level that really matters. You give me somebody who disagrees with me on every issue, but who has a good heart, who has the ability to sympathize with others, participate in their woes, longings, and dreams. Well, I want to stay with that person all day. You give me a person who agrees with me on every particular, but who has a cold, resentful heart. Well, I want nothing to do with him or her. Artists generally don't set out to improve other people. They just want to create a perfect expression of their experience. But their art has the potential to humanize the beholder. How does it do this? First, beauty impels us to pay a certain kind of attention. It startles you and prompts you to cast off the self-centered tendency to always be imposing your opinions on things. It prompts you to stop in your tracks, take a breath, and open yourself up so that you can receive what it is offering, often with a kind of childlike awe and reverence. It trains you to see the world in a more patient, just, and humble way. In The Sovereignty of Good, the novelist and philosopher Iris Murdoch writes that, quote, virtue is the attempt to piece the veil. To, no, I'm going to start that over. Virtue is the attempt to pierce the veil of selfish consciousness and join the world as it really is, end quote. Second, artworks widen your emotional repertoire. When you read a poem or see a piece of sculpture, you haven't learned a new fact, but you've had a new experience. The British philosopher Roger Scruton wrote, quote, the listener to Mozart's Jupiter Symphony is presented with the open floodgates of human joy and creativity. The reader of Proust is led through the enchanted world of childhood and made to understand the uncanny prophecy of our later griefs, which those days of joy contain. End quote. These experiences furnish us with a kind of emotional knowledge, how to feel and how to express feelings, how to sympathize with someone who is grieving, how to share the satisfaction of a parent who has seen her child grow. Third, art teaches you to see the world through the eyes of another, often a person who sees more deeply than you do. Sure, Picasso's Guernica is a political piece of art about an atrocity in the Spanish Civil War, but it doesn't represent documentary-like an exact scene in that war. It goes deeper to give us an experience of pure horror, the universal experience of suffering, and the reality of human bloodlust that leads to it. Of course, Invisible Man is a political novel about racial injustice, but as Ralph Ellison later wrote, he was trying to write not just a novel of racial protest, but also a quote, dramatic study in comparative humanity, which I felt any worthwhile novel should be. End quote. I haul myself off to museums and such with the fear that in a political and technological age, the arts have become less central to public life, 
that we don't seem to debate novels and artistic breakthroughs the way people did in other times, that the artistic and literary worlds have themselves become stultified by insular groupthink, and this has contributed to the dehumanization of American culture. But we can still stage our many rebellions, kick our political addictions from time to time, and enjoy the free play of mind, the undogmatic spirit, and the heightened and adrenalized states of awareness that the best art still provides. Earlier this year, I visited the Edward Hopper show at the Whitney a couple of times, and I got to see New York through man's eyes, through that man's eyes, the spare rooms on side streets, and the isolated people inside. I forget most of what I read, but these images stay vivid in the mind. Thank you, David Brooks. You have a lot of ideas there that I think about how to slow down life, how to give space to meditative thinking, how to observe um, life through different filters. As I live, I think that's my one of my greatest joys about being in Tennessee right now is that I get to rotate among <clears throat> a lot of lifestyle choices, a lot of viewpoints uh, that are not necessarily aligned with mine. But as he said, if, the, if people have a good heart and are living the golden rule, which is common to every culture in the world, this idea of let's treat others the way we would like to be treated, I think that we can find common ground in these discussions and in this art. And as I close today, I um, want to say that I'm also going to see a going to support a concert on Monday. Um, what is the name of that? I'm going to look it up while we're here. It's to support um, Oh, my live is today at 12.45. Oh. Well, maybe I'll end this stream. Or no, I guess it'll come up. My niece is trying to help me with this. But I want you to know about this concert, people that live in uh, Nashville area. It's called Love Rising. Let freedom sing and dance. It's a celebration of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's a lot of wonderful artists like, let's see who's on this. It's got Jason Isbell, Brothers Osborne, Amanda Shires, Brittany Howard, Allison Russell. Ooh, a lot of good people. Cheryl Crow, Marin Morris, Yola, um, Joy Alatican, Julian Baker. Anyway, it's supporting some of the ideas uh, in resistance to Tennessee legislation that's trying to shut down a lot of freedom of thinking and freedom of uh, conscience. So anybody that's here, you might check that out. That concert happens March 20th, this Monday. And I am going to say goodbye for now. I hope that uh, you will find me on here and join me in deeper thinking and discussion.